Hello, I'm Hal Weber, and today I want to give you a technical introduction to a remarkable Eiffel capability called SCOOP. SCOOP stands for Simple Concurrent Object-Oriented Programming, and it first became available with Eiffel Studio version 6.8. Now, to get the most out of this presentation, you should be familiar already with Eiffel and Design by Contract. So if you're new to Eiffel, you might want to view the Eiffel Overview and the Design by Contract presentations before you watch this one. So here's our agenda. We'll start off with a brief review of what concurrent computation is all about, and then we'll get into the details of the SCOOP model of concurrency. Finally, we'll dissect an example from the Eiffel Studio distribution and look at the facilities of SCOOP in action. Concurrent computation, in simple terms, is having a computer or a number of computers do more than one task simultaneously, or at least to appear to do more than one task simultaneously. Concurrency comes in two primary forms, multitasking and multiprocessing. In multitasking, a single processor divides its time among multiple tasks. The advantage to this is that while one task is waiting, say on input or output, another task can be computing. In multiprocessing, more processors are involved, so even parts of a single task may be farmed out to other processors when appropriate. Of course, multitasking and multiprocessing can, under certain circumstances, be combined to make things as efficient as possible. Concurrent computation can be supported by many types of underlying architectures, from the closely coupled, like multiple process threads, to the highly distributed, like web services. But on an abstract level, they all have multitasking and or multiprocessing in common. So why do we pursue concurrent computation? As you probably already know, the answer is improved throughput. By doing tasks concurrently, we try to maximize the efficiency of the computer resources that we have. Suppose we have a simple routine that applies the feature Task 1 to Object 1 and then Task 2 to Object 2. If we look at what happens when a single CPU executes these tasks sequentially, we see that the total execution time is the sum of the times required by the two tasks. But if we add a second CPU, we could allow task 1 to run on CPU 1 while task 2 runs on CPU 2 concurrently. Then the total time to accomplish both tasks becomes the maximum of the two times. With step changes in hardware performance becoming harder to achieve, and with multi-core processors becoming increasingly commonplace, it will be critical for us to be able to exploit concurrency in ways that are manageable and understandable. In fact, many leaders in industry and academics see concurrency as the single most important technical challenge we'll face in the near future. We can no longer depend upon the chip makers to bail us out of our performance woes. Well, why is concurrency a challenge? Even though concurrent computation may look pretty straightforward on this slide, it's important to understand that with concurrency comes a whole new set of opportunities for failure. So, what could possibly go wrong? Well, as long as the individual tasks that we farm out to multiple threads, processes, or processors are completely independent of one another, then we're not in too much danger. But as soon as we need to share resources among simultaneously executing tasks, that's when things can get ugly. And we come to the realization that sharing resources is necessary, usually about 20 minutes into the project. Anyway, it's some time before we've drained our second can of Red Bull. Concurrency problems take two common forms, deadlocks and starvation. A deadlock is a situation in which two or more concurrent tasks reach an impasse because each needs a resource which is being reserved by one of the others. No task will give up the resource they hold, and they can't proceed until they can access the resources that other tasks won't give up. Starvation occurs when some task competing for shared resources just never gets the resources it needs to execute. So the resources may be freed and reallocated, but for some reason the starving task never gets all that's necessary to run. 
Starvation occurs as a result of lack of fairness in how resources are allocated. So what do we do about access to shared resources? Simply put, we have to have a reliable way of synchronizing access to the resources which will prevent or at least detect deadlocks and starvation. In traditional solutions to the problem of synchronization of access to shared resources, several mechanisms have evolved as useful over a number of years. Still, using these mechanisms is perilous. They must be employed with great care or the problems just mentioned can crop up, and when they do, concurrency makes them very difficult to debug. I'm not going to say much more about these traditional synchronization mechanisms because the most important thing you need to know about them from a scoop perspective is that you won't need to know anything about them. There have been some efforts to produce formal models for constructing concurrent systems, but like formal specification methods, these are grounded in mathematics that's not well understood by most programmers or their managers. Cases have been made in favor of some of the functional and functional hybrid programming languages is more conducive to concurrency than typical object-oriented languages. Without really evaluating the merits of these arguments, we know that moving to a different programming paradigm can be painful and expensive. Also, it would be a shame to give up the extraordinary full life cycle modeling expressiveness of the object-oriented paradigm. I think that the fact that some experts would make the serious suggestion that in order to get concurrency under control we need mathematical models or a shift in programming paradigm is a pretty clear sign that concurrent programming when done in the traditional way is fraught with difficulties. Fortunately, life doesn't have to be so difficult. Let's examine the scoop model and see what it has to offer. What are the features of Scoop that distinguish it from other concurrency solutions? Well, first, Scoop occupies a higher level of abstraction. Scoop software is therefore independent of the underlying mechanisms for both concurrent execution and synchronization. This means that the same Scoop software systems that you write targeted to execute multiple process threads are just as valid targeted to distributed computing. Second, Scoop allows you to use the tools and techniques with which you're already familiar. Scoop is simply a broadening of our view of object-oriented programming. To support Scoop and Eiffel, only one new key word, separate, has been added to the Eiffel language. Designed by contract, the backbone of the Eiffel development method is also integral to Scoop with contract semantics adapted slightly to support concurrency. Third, Scoop uses the familiar act of passing arguments to routines as an indicator of the need for synchronization access. In the next few slides, you'll get an idea of how these things all come together. The first entry in your Scoop glossary should be Processor. A processor in Scoop terms is an autonomous thread of control capable of sequential execution of instructions on one or more objects. It's important to understand, despite the fact that I use the term thread in the definition, that a scoop processor does not imply any particular hardware or software implementation. A scoop processor might be implemented by a process thread, but it also might be implemented by some other mechanism, say a separate distributed computer system. In scoop, each runtime object has one and only one scoop processor that handles it. However, each scoop processor can handle more than one runtime object. So in traditional sequential Eiffel, there's only one processor which handles all the runtime objects in the whole system. And scoop broadens this notion by allowing some objects to be handled by their own processors, consequently opening up the possibility of concurrent execution. At the risk of getting a little ahead of myself, I want to point out here that all calls requested of a particular scoop processor will execute in the order in which they were requested. So scoop, to some extent, can be viewed as imposing order on an otherwise unordered world of concurrent execution. If that doesn't make sense right now, just try to remember that I said it, because I'll bring it back to haunt you when you've got a little more scoop under your belt. As we've already learned, Scoop is object-oriented programming. As such, the model of object-oriented computation with which we're all familiar still applies, 
Here, a feature represented by F is applied to the object attached to X, possibly involving a set of arguments represented by A. We generally regard this as feature call, or alternatively, as feature application. But object-oriented concurrency requires us to think just a little differently about the model. Because the object attached to X might be handled by a different processor than the caller of F, and not necessarily synchronized with the caller, we have to recognize a distinction between feature call and feature application. Feature call, then, we see as merely a request that the feature F be applied to the object attached to X. Feature application occurs when the processor handling the object associated with X actually gets around to executing F on X. Another key concept in Scoop is the idea of separateness. It is separateness that designates that some objects will, or at least could possibly, be handled by a different scoop processor than those referencing them. This is how objects can become shared resources for concurrently executing clients. To get a handle on separateness, we need to get two definitions down here, separate type and separate call. A separate type is a type which has been declared with the separate keyword. Here, sep underscore x is of type separate x. Separate calls are feature calls whose target is of a separate type. So any request to apply a feature to sep underscore x will be a separate call. Whether a feature call is a separate call matters, because as we will see now, there are only certain conditions under which separate calls are valid. The separate argument rule tells us when separate calls are valid. A separate call sep underscore x dot f of a is valid only if sep underscore x is an argument of the enclosing routine. That means an argument of the routine in which the feature called sep underscore x dot f of a actually appears. So let's look at valid and invalid separate calls. Suppose we're working with a class that has an attribute, separate underscore attribute, declared as a separate type. Some routine of the class includes a feature call on separate underscore attribute. This is a separate call by definition. Unfortunately, though, it's an invalid separate call and will cause a compiler error. That's because it violates the separate argument rule by trying to apply a feature directly to the separately typed attribute. The next line of code calls a second feature of the class passing the separate attribute as an argument. In the enclosing routine, a feature is applied to the corresponding formal argument. This separate call is valid because it does conform to the separate argument rule. So here we have both an invalid and a valid separate call. The separate argument rule, as it's stated here, turns out to be a bit too restrictive to serve Scoop fully. Still, it's a good way to understand the basic concept of the enclosing routine. We'll expand this idea of valid targets for separate calls when we learn more about controlled and uncontrolled expressions. Here's another Scoop rule that helps to ensure synchronized access to shared resources. It's called the wait rule, and it states that a routine call with separate arguments will execute when all corresponding processes are available and hold them for the duration of the call. What it means by corresponding processors is any scoop processor that handles one of the objects that are associated with the feature's separate arguments. Let's look at a routine that's taken from the dining philosopher's example. It's how philosophers eat. This routine eat takes two arguments, both of type separate fork. The wait rule says that when a client makes a feature call to this routine, the processor responsible for executing eat will wait to apply the feature until the processors associated with the objects attached to A underscore left and A underscore right are available for exclusive access. Once the processors are available, the feature application can proceed. In the online documentation on the page that deals with Scoop implementation in Eiffel Studio, you'll see that because of optimizations, there's a little bit of wiggle room in the wait rule. 
the implementation will actually go ahead and execute up to the point that a separate call occurs and then wait on the availability of all processors necessary for the feature application. In the routine EAT, this optimization would make no difference because its implementation consists only of two separate calls. Now let's look at two more scoop glossary entries, controlled and uncontrolled expressions. Controlled expressions are either of a non-separate type or of a separate type and are handled by the same processor as one of the separate arguments to the enclosing routine. So controlled expressions are those for which, in a particular execution context, the enclosing routine has exclusive control. So all non-separate types are handled by the processor of the current object. That makes them controlled. And any type that is handled by the same processor as one of the separate arguments of the enclosing routine is also controlled. We know this because the wait rule tells us that execution won't begin until all those processors are available for exclusive access. An uncontrolled expression is any that's not controlled. That boils down to expressions of separate types which are not handled by a processor associated with one of the separate arguments of the enclosing routine. I'm going to bring back that code that we looked at when we considered the separate argument rule. Remember the first call to sum underscore feature we said is invalid because it attempted to apply sum underscore feature directly to the separate attribute. The second call to sum underscore feature is valid because it was applied to an argument of the enclosing routine. Notice that the target of the invalid call is uncontrolled in the context of the routine in which the call occurs, and that the target of the valid call is controlled in its routine. So you see the correspondence between the requirement of the separate argument rule and controlled expressions. A separate argument of the enclosing routine is required by the separate argument rule, will always be a controlled expression. But in actuality, the rule could be generalized to say that any expression that is controlled, as defined here, qualifies as a valid target for a separate call. The notions of controlled and uncontrolled will play a part later when we see how design by contract works with Scoop. Now let's talk about how we milk the throughput advantage out of concurrency. To do this, we need to understand that certain feature calls will be synchronous, while others will be asynchronous. A synchronous feature call is what we're used to seeing in traditional Eiffel. We make a feature call, the feature is applied, that is, a routine is executed and or a value is returned, and then we go on to the next feature call. The calling client does not proceed until the feature application is complete. But with Scoop, we can also have asynchronous feature calls. When a client makes an asynchronous feature call, really all that happens is a request to apply the feature gets logged with the Scoop processor handling the object that's the target of the call. And the important thing to know is that once the call is logged, then the client continues its execution immediately without waiting for the feature application to complete. Asynchronous calls are the key to concurrency in Scoop. As you might have surmised, only separate calls can be asynchronous. But it's important to understand that not all separate calls will be asynchronous. To increase concurrent computation using Scoop, you increase the amount of computation that can be done with asynchronous feature calls. So now let's find out how to tell which calls will be asynchronous and which calls will not. At this point, you might want to make sure your seat belt's securely fastened, because this next section gets just the tiniest bit bumpy. Fortunately, after you work with Scoop, even just for a short time, it all becomes second nature. Well, here we go. A call is synchronous if it is a non-separate call. That's not too tough. So all non-separate calls are synchronous. But separate calls can be synchronous, too. Separate calls that are queries are synchronous. This makes sense because a query returns an object, and presumably the client will immediately want to use that object for some purpose. 
So the client routines wait until a separate query is complete before proceeding. We call this wait by necessity. Some separate commands are executed synchronously. These are commands that have at least one actual argument, which is either a separate argument of the enclosing routine or is current, representing the current object. Let's look at these two cases more closely. First, S2.2.1 says that a separate call will be synchronous if one of its actual arguments is a separate argument of the routine in which the call occurs. We know from the wait rule that exclusive access to the processors of separate arguments will be gained before a routine can execute. So if that routine then calls another routine and passes on one or more of its separate arguments to that called routine, it must pass the access with those arguments. In situations in which this access passing occurs, the calling routine, having temporarily given away its access, must wait until the called routine completes before proceeding. Case S2.2.2 .2 is similar in nature. If a routine has passed a reference to the current object to another routine, it waits until that routine completes before continuing to execute in the context of the current object. So those are the cases which make calls synchronous. What does that leave us for calls that will execute asynchronously? It is precisely any call that's not synchronous. Any separate call to a command which has either no arguments or a set of arguments which does not include either a separate argument of the enclosing routine or current. Okay, that does it for this admittedly nasty looking slide. Here again, if this seems a little dawning at first, fret not, it will all become intuitive after you've worked with Scoop for a while. Now let's turn our attention to how Design by Contract fits in with Scoop. In Eiffel, we specify the semantics of classes through design by contract. Preconditions and postconditions on features define the contract obligations and benefits for both clients and suppliers. Class invariants define the validity of class instances. In the presence of Scoop, we will see that these characteristics still apply, but with slightly different runtime behavior. Let's consider class invariance first, because it's the simplest case. The separate argument rule tells us that separate calls can only be made on arguments of the enclosing routine. This generally precludes any separate calls from being coded directly in a class invariant. The things you need to know are these. Invariants work the same way in Scoop as in traditional Eiffel, and that each object's processor is responsible for evaluating its class invariant. In order to understand the effect of scoop on preconditions and postconditions, we first need to define the terms controlled and uncontrolled as they apply to assertion clauses. Each precondition and postcondition clause can be either controlled or uncontrolled. These terms have their basis in the definitions of controlled and uncontrolled expressions that we saw earlier. Let's see what the distinction is. An assertion clause for a feature F is controlled if, after substitution of actual arguments, the clause involves only calls on entities which are controlled in the context of the routine which is the caller of F. Otherwise, the assertion clause is uncontrolled. The key to understanding this is that whether a precondition or postcondition assertion clause is controlled or uncontrolled, must be determined by the context of the caller of the routine containing the clauses. Let's look at an example. This is a procedure from the baboon crossing example in the Eiffel Studio distribution. The precondition contains two assertion clauses. Each is a separate call on an object attached to the formal argument A underscore rope. Are these controlled or uncontrolled? Well, we can't tell at this point because we don't see the calling routine or routines. So depending upon what the caller passes for A underscore rope, these assertion clauses could be either controlled or uncontrolled. If the object passed by the caller was controlled in the caller's context, then both of these clauses are controlled because they involve only calls to the objects attached to A underscore rope. 
Likewise, if the object passed by the caller as A underscore rope is uncontrolled in the context of the caller, these clauses are uncontrolled. Now to the point. Whether an assertion clause is controlled or uncontrolled affects the runtime semantics of preconditions and postconditions. Let's check it out. For controlled precondition clauses, the semantics are the same as in sequential Eiffel. A violation of a controlled precondition clause causes an exception in the caller. We call these precondition clauses correctness conditions. Therefore, as in sequential Eiffel, it is the responsibility of the caller to make certain that these correctness conditions hold before making the call. Violations of uncontrolled precondition clauses are different. Because uncontrolled precondition clauses involve objects of separate types that are not controlled by the caller, even if the caller were to check to make certain that the precondition clauses held before the call, actions of some other scoop processor could falsify the clauses before the feature was applied. Because of this, the caller is not held responsible for uncontrolled precondition clauses, and a violation of an uncontrolled precondition clause does not cause an exception in the caller. Instead, it causes the application of the feature to wait until such time as the precondition clause becomes true. We call uncontrolled precondition clauses wait conditions. Here's our mount feature from Baboon Crossing again. If the object passed for A underscore rope is controlled by the caller, then the caller must ensure that A underscore rope dot is underscore secure and A underscore rope dot direction equal direction are true or risk incurring a precondition violation exception. On the other hand, if the object passed as A underscore rope is uncontrolled by the caller, then the application of mount will wait until both a underscore rope dot is underscore secure and a underscore rope dot direction equal direction are true and then execute. Now, how about post conditions? Well, for control post condition clauses, again, it's like sequential Eiffel. The calling client can assume that the clause holds because no other scoop processor can affect it. Uncontrolled post-condition clauses are evaluated by the processor of their target, and importantly, these are evaluated asynchronously. That is, the weight by necessity, which usually applies to queries, is not in effect. So the evaluation of uncontrolled post-condition clauses constitutes an exception to the rules for synchronous and asynchronous calls that we covered earlier. So those are the basics of the interaction of scoop with design by contract. Now, before we finish, let's look at some of the code from one of the scoop examples. The example we'll use will be the single element producer consumer example. The example involves a producer who produces a product. In the case of this example, the product is an integer. Okay, so our product is not exactly in the same league as the Airbus A380, but it'll work just fine for this example. Then there's a consumer who consumes integers. The producer and consumer share access to an inventory that can contain only one product at a time. This means that the producer can only produce a new product when the inventory is empty, and the consumer can only consume a product when the inventory is full. The producer's act of production fills the inventory, and the consumer's act of consumption empties the inventory. The example has a root class that kicks everything off. It declares a producer, a consumer, and an inventory all as separate types. The root procedure make creates the inventory and then the producer and consumer. Notice that the producer and consumer are passed two arguments. Item underscore count is an integer constant that lets the consumer and producer know how many products to produce or consume over the course of their brief and meaningless lives. The other argument is a reference to the shared inventory object. Next, make calls another procedure run, passing the producer and consumer as arguments. Let's look at run. All run does is apply live in turn to both producer and consumer. So you might think that this whole routine could be eliminated by moving these two instructions into make and applying live directly to the attributes like this. 
This wouldn't work. In fact, we would receive compiler errors telling us that we're trying to apply features to objects of separate types that were not controlled. Essentially, we have violated the separate argument rule. The routine run provides an enclosing routine for the application of features to producer and consumer. Therefore, make looks like this, and it calls run, passing the separate attributes as arguments. Now, taking a quick look at part of the specification of class inventory, we see a query item, which returns the current item in inventory. Item has a precondition that says that item cannot be applied unless the single element inventory is full. To support this requirement, we see the Boolean query has underscore item also. There are two commands, put and remove. Put is used by the producer to enter a product in the inventory. Put can be applied only if the value is valid and the inventory is empty. Remove is used by the consumer to empty the inventory after accessing the current item, so naturally it requires that the inventory is full. Next, here are some features of the producer class. The class has an attribute that holds a reference to the shared single element inventory. The live routine called by the root class just produces an inventory item the prescribed number of times. It does this by calling the produce routine, passing the inventory as an argument. So you see here that produce will be an enclosing routine for operations on inventory. Produce has a precondition clause that says that the inventory must be empty before the application of produce. How do we determine the semantics of the precondition clause? We look at the clause itself in the calling routine live. By doing so, we can see that this precondition clause is an uncontrolled assertion clause because it involves inventory, passed of course as an argument, and that inventory was indeed uncontrolled in the context of live. So this means that if inventory happens not to be empty at the time of the call to produce, the application of produce will be delayed until such time as the inventory is indeed empty. At this point, you might want to think back on that statement that I made that to a large extent, scoop is about ordering of operations in a concurrent execution environment. It may be easier now for you to see that a scoop processor handling a particular separate object may have a queue of operations that need to be performed, but can only apply those features when conditions are right. Scoop ensures that the multiple feature calls on a particular object are applied in the order in which they're requested. Okay, very quickly, the last thing to see is the consume feature from the class consumer. When you look at the producer and consumer classes, you'll notice that they're essentially symmetrical in the sense that each shares the inventory object and that each uses the passing of the separate inventory attribute into a routine plus the precondition on the routine to synchronize access to the inventory. Here, consume can only be applied at such time as the processor handling the inventory object is available for exclusive access and the inventory is full that is, has underscore item, is true. So as in the case of produce and the producer, the precondition clause is a wait condition and will cause the application of consume to wait until the inventory is full before executing. Okay, let's wrap up. I hope I've been able to convey to you why I think Scoop is a beautifully designed groundbreaking technology. We've seen that Scoop works at a level of abstraction above concurrency implementations and commonly used synchronization mechanisms. So with Scoop, you never use a mutex or a semaphore or a spin lock. You just use Eiffel. And with Scoop, at the time that you're building concurrent software systems, you don't need to concern yourself with whether your Scoop processors will be running on separate network computers or on multiple process threads on a single computer. The Scoop code is the same. We've seen that Scoop uses only the familiar elements of object-oriented programming, that is to say, argument passing and design by contract. So there's no paradigm shift necessary for using Scoop. In the race for technologies with the potential to tame the beast of concurrent programming, I think these properties give Scoop a definite edge. Well, as is often the case, that was a lot of information in a short amount of time. There are only two more things that I want to mention.
One is the set of scoop examples that comes with Eiffel Studio. You can compile and experiment with each of the examples as you wish. To get a little extra insight, you'll find that each example has its own page in the Eiffel Software online documentation for Scoop. These pages describe each example problem and point out some of the specific Scoop concepts that are showcased. Speaking of the Scoop online documentation, that's the other thing I want to mention. The documentation for Scoop contains a lot of the same material you've seen here, but it covers some of it in more detail. In the docs, you'll also find practical advice for the implementation-specific issues. For example, the docs explain the different project settings that you should use to enable or disable Scoop in Eiffel Studio. I hope this presentation has given you enough information to get started using Scoop to build concurrent systems.